perspective of God, not just for a word, but to be with him. And then you just giving us the abundance of that intimacy. We thank you for sharing your oil with us. We honor you. We bless you. In Jesus' name. Standing. Don't sit down just yet. I know you used to be making declarations, but I just want you to let your hands for a second. The Holy Spirit to you. And that's like tonight, the kind of nights where destinies are born. I feel great fear and trembling about the responsibility of standing behind the sacred desk, but even more so when God is in the room. When God's in the room, no matter how good your words sound, if it ain't Him, it falls flat. Yeah. And so, what I want to do in this place is as a collective, can we give this night to Jesus? Jesus. And say He's allowed to do whatever He wants, even up to this point. I'll say something quickly before we do so. Jesus. I know it's often said that there's no preaching in heaven. But I disagree with that statement because the Bible doesn't say that the angels in Isaiah 6 were singing one to another. It says they were crying. John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness. Come on. And he wasn't singing. Come on, Sam. Which means there's the kind of preaching that can be worship. It can lead a people deeper into his presence. And that's the kind of preaching I'm committed to for the rest of my life. And so tonight... Can we just ask the Holy Spirit desperately to have his way in this place? On the count of three, can you just lift up your own oh, prayer stand? Spirit. Ready? One, two, three. Let's go. Let's go. Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, Jesus we ask you would honor increase. you in this atmosphere. You would increase in this, room. this holy temple. You would have you say this is your house. Come and you're allowed to do whatever you want. Tonight, You've been Jesus. doing the things that you desire. Everything and tonight we ask Jesus. that it would be no different, but that you would continue the legacy of your power and your authority moving forward as the word of the Lord is preached. I pray that every word out of my mouth would be from your spirit and authored by your hand and that the people of God in this atmosphere will participate even in from heavenly places down to receive what is about to take place and that it would be a literal act of intercession what takes place in this room. On behalf of Columbus, Ohio, and the nation of America, we bless you, Lord Jesus, for what you're about to do. And we agree in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, wherever you are, can you just lift up a praise to Jesus? Thank you, God. Come on, come on, come on. Don't tell me you ran out of energy while you was running around this room. Thank you, Jesus. He's got the whole night. And if you got something to give him. He's going to take it. Come on, lift up your voices. Lift Thank up your voices. You, Thank Jesus, you, Jesus, hey, we You're worship worthy, you. Worthy. We honor you. You're worthy. We honor you, Jesus. In this place tonight, stay standing. Pull out your Bibles. Thank you. We're going to read the scripture. Ba, ba, ba. I'm going to relieve Nathan so he can sit down and get some water. And um, I'm going to do my best to, to preach this word, okay? If you can, turn to Matthew 5. We're only going to read a couple of verses of scripture. Unlike usual, but you know, we'll, we'll just get to the point this time. I feel the Holy Spirit. Okay, are you ready? Matthew five thirteen through sixteen. I don't know if you're there. Can you say I'm there? I'm there. All right, that's enough people. So whoever's not, um, you're on your own. Okay, here we go. Let's keep playing while I read this word, man. All right, here it comes. You are the salt of the earth, mm. but if the salt loses its flavor. How shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. This is where our uh, thought starts. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Thank you, Jesus. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. You guys can take your seats. In my sermon, I have debated a lot about what I'm telling you. The name of my sermon is All of the Lights. 
<laughs> okay. You can roll. Jesus. Tonight's message up front is a message to revivalists. I have no intention of isolating anyone or making them feel like um, there isn't something for them. But sometimes this specific message and the tone of voice that that message has to be given in has to be specific to its audience. And so if you don't consider yourself to be a revivalist, you may feel like this message is irrelevant to you. But I believe that God set you in this room. If he knew what he was going to ask me to preach, he set you in this room because you have an inheritance That's it. in revival in the earth. And so I wanted you to set your mind from the conversation and context that you are a revivalist. Okay, can you just say that over yourself before we continue? Can you just say, I am, I am a revivalist. A revivalist. One more time, say, I am, I am a revivalist. A revivalist. Tonight's a message to revivalists, and it's going to be convicting for you as it was for me. But I believe it's going to open up something that can change the trajectory of your life, if that's okay. So to start my thought, one of my things, if, you know, if you're a preacher and doesn't love the word of God, you should find a different profession. I love the word of God. I'm actually what they call a Bible nerd. Um, and so I enjoy um, just diving into scriptures and doing random research projects on my own time about what scripture is saying. And one of my favorite things to study in scripture is how natural elements are personified. It's a real interesting idea to me how God uses symbolism and poetry to describe his ideas and his plans and his purposes. But even more than that, I'm fascinated by how Jesus decides to describe himself. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated with the idea that Jesus chooses specific words and chooses specific ideas to describe himself. And and. If you're a nerd like me, you understand that there's a biblical principle that whatever God chooses to describe himself as, there's a revelation that can be tapped into that you can actually inhabit and experience in your daily life. And so when you study scripture and you find God revealing himself in specific ways, there's something in it for you. It's not just a nice idea. It's not just the Instagram caption. There is an inheritance in that revelation for you. And one of my favorite things to discover is the names of God, the descriptors of God. And we know that God is a lot of things. God is love. We talk about it pretty often. And we often talk about it as though the words are in reverse. Like love is God. When Ooh. God is actually love. Which means that love is defined by God and not the other way around. But God is love. Another thing that God is, is holy. That means he's pure. He's spotless. There's nothing wrong with him. If you think there's something wrong with him, there's something wrong with you. God is holy. But one of my favorite things that God is, according to 1 John. Is that God is light. Mm. The Bible says God is light. And that in him there is no darkness. At all. This is really, 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 really big. Because oftentimes we, can, we think about the scriptures and adjectives of God. In a specific way, but you've got to understand that he is light. Light itself is a manifestation and a personification of God in your life. You can see the sun, you can see the stars, and what you're seeing is Earth's best attempt at describing the nature and the character of God. Mm. It's pretty interesting to me. Uh, we know Jesus and we know God as creator first in scripture. In Genesis 1, the first way God decides to reveal himself is as a creator. And that's really powerful. And we preach about that often and we talk about that often. But I paid attention to what he decided to create the first time he created. In the history of creation, the first thing he decided to make was light. So light must be very important to God. If he describes himself as it, and it's the first thing he decided to create, it's pretty important to him. And I want to describe to you that there are many different kinds of lights, hence the title of my sermon. You'll understand a little bit more as we go. But I want to describe some things that give you an understanding of God's light specifically. Okay, can we do that? Mm. The first one, as we describe God himself, God's light is holy. The Bible says that he dwells in unapproachable light. Yes. That doesn't mean you can't get close to him. It means that you can't be common 
in his presence. Yes, your physical body can't stand to stand next to the manifestation of God, but it's saying something a whole lot more. It's saying something about the separateness of God yes. in comparison to everything that there is in creation. Does that make sense? Yeah. The next thing that's interesting to me is that the light of God is marvelous, which mm -hmm. means it's worthy of being awed at. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. When you see him, you look at him and it provokes what we call worship. Jesus. Worship is not about songs. It's not about singing. It's not about uh, e even specific dances or specific sounds. Worship is awing at the nature and the character of God. Yes. And that happens from a, a, an understanding of what is called his marvelous light, according to First Peter 2. His light is marvelous. It provokes marveling or wonder inside of you. Does that make sense? The next one that I want to talk about is Psalm 27. This is really, really, really big because the fear is one of the primary things that our generation struggles with. Yeah. But the Bible says that the reason why you don't have to be afraid, and I feel it coming, is not because the Lord is just strong, it's not because he sees all, it's not because he knows all, but the Bible says it's because he is your light. That's what David said in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, of whom shall I fear, which means the only reason why you're afraid it's because you can't see. There's something about Whoa. God that illuminates everything in your path, illuminates everything in your way, and it breaks the authority of fear off of your life. Wow. This is the light of God. It's really important for you to know him as light because we are a missional organization. And I would say even beyond missional, we are co-missional. Yes. Which, which means we are committed to the mission of God and activating people in said mission. And in order for you to be activated in that mission, you've got to understand why light is so important. You might think it's nice that he's light, he is light. You might think that it's cool that he is light. But it's something much deeper. And you'll know it when you can recognize that the world that we live in is full of darkness yeah. and we it's pretty culturally common to describe the world as dark but I want to give you some descriptives so that you can understand it so I want to do something right now um, we, we're going to talk more about light but I want to describe to you what I call is the process of deconstructing darkness because we use darkness as a general word but I feel like there are some specifics that are going to bring you into the necessity for the light of God to enter the earth you've got to understand the, the real actual authority and the function of darkness for you to understand why light is so important okay so the first thing that I want you to understand is that darkness is not just the absence of light mm -hmm. it's actually a thing and the reason why i know that is because genesis 1 says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and what darkness, darkness. was over the face of the deep and then later in genesis 1 the bible says that god called that darkness night so if darkness was nothing he wouldn't have named it oh come on darkness is something Yes. It's not just the absence of light. It's the presence of another power. Yes. It's the presence of another authority, another kingdom, another structure, which is the first thing I want you to understand about darkness. Darkness is actually a kingdom. It, it, it's really, really important for you. It's the opposite kingdom to the one that we serve. He's not just the devil. He's the, he's the ruler of the kingdom of darkness. This is extremely important. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and what? Rulers, Rulers of, of darkness. darkness. Which means that darkness has authority structures. It has government. Whoa. It has entire systems of authority attached to it. The next thing that you got to understand is that darkness has an attached mindset. This is really Jesus. important. John 1 says this about God. It says, in him was life, and that life was the light of man. And what? That light shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. Which means darkness has a mindset. It has a construction of understanding. It has a way it filters information and processes it throughout the being of a person to come to conclusions and deductions wow. and ideas. You've got to understand that darkness is more than just a setting in your natural world. It actually sets up construction for the way that you think Jesus Whew. this is important this is how can darkness comprehend anything whoa except it has a mind and it implements that mind in every place where its authority is delegated 
My God. Every place where its authority has been subjugated, it literally adds the influence of its mind into that place and its entire framework of being. Does that make sense? Yeah. The next one that's important for you to understand is that darkness is also an emotional state. Now, there's Ooh. another descriptive word that will give you understanding to this that will help you get this framework. And I got to do a little bit of foundation before we get to the sword because this is important for you. You've got to start putting yourself in other people's shoes, okay? So darkness, if it's going to be described by any other word, I describe it by the word hopelessness. Yes. Hopelessness is a pretty um, broad stroke word. It's a general word, but there's a few other words that might um, coincide with it. And some of these words might give you a, a greater understanding of how the kingdom of darkness operates. Okay. So sometimes hopelessness manifests as defeat. It manifests as depression. It manifests as anxiety, sadness, rage, fear. Um, it, it, the Bible literally says sorrow will last for a night. Now, do you remember what God named the darkness? Night. Which means that sorrow, it wasn't just about a timeline. That scripture wasn't about an allotted time. It was about a season and a setting that was associated with your sorrow. Which Whoa. means that if you're in perpetual sorrow, you might be surrounded by some darkness. Whoa. It wasn't just about a season. It was about a setting. I need you to understand what I'm saying. You might be embracing things that are uh, that are literally connected to a whole other kingdom. And that's the reason why you can't get out of that place of heaviness. It's the reason why you, you feel weird every time you wake up wow. in the morning. It's the reason why you prefer life with the lights off. Oh, Jesus. The next thing that's important to understand about this is that one of the emotional states that is produced by darkness is exhaustion. How do I know? When you have to walk around in the dark, imagine how tired your eyes get. Imagine how tired your brain begins to get because you're having to, to literally fix your eyes to see in the dark. It's an exhausting experience. And most of the time you still can't see, but you're fighting internally to set your mechanisms so that you can see the world around you. And so people who live in darkness oftentimes live in perpetual exhaustion and they don't know how to explain it, but it's because they're trying to see in the dark. Wow. Darkness, darkness, darkness. And this is important to you because darkness is not just an emotional state. It's not just a mindset. It's actually a progenitor of deep places of pain. I'll take it like this. I just talked about walking in the dark. Imagine if this yeah. entire room was completely blacked out, no lights whatsoever, and you had to walk around here trying to find your keys, trying to figure out where they are. Somebody threw them across the room during the parade break by accident, and now the room is completely dark. You can't find the lights, and you've got to find your keys. The issue is you're going to be spending the entire tr time trying to dodge chairs, trying to dodge stairs, trying to dodge all this other kind of stuff, Jesus. and you won't be able to see, and eventually you Gonna hit something. This facts. Come on. And the pain is not just there because you hit it. Follow me. My God. The pain is there because you couldn't see it. Jesus. So it which means that when you're in darkness, things hurt a little deeper. Uh, when you're in darkness, pain literally has a taxation attached to it. Not just because the thing hurt, but because you hurt in the dark. My God. There's a place to hurt. That's another sermon for another day. But some of y'all need to learn how to hurt in the right place. There's some numbers that ain't the right place to hurt. There's some friends groups that ain't the right place to hurt. And if you can learn God. how to hurt, you might just heal. Wow. Jesus. Darkness. 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 This is extremely important. I've never really heard anyone describe Genesis 1 from this angle, but it's extremely important for you to understand that before there was light, because we love to preach about the light. Here come the light. Turn on the light. Let there be light. But before <laughs> there was light, there was darkness. Yes. I need you to understand this, which means that darkness is an extremely important concept for you to understand in God, which means that part of the identity even of light is to interrupt the current place of darkness. Jesus. They're interconnected forever. This is, this, uh, I'm going to keep saying it. It's really important. But in that place, if you remember Genesis 1, the Bible says darkness was over the face of the deep. And this is important for those who are living in the kingdom of darkness or those who are assigned to pull people out. Amen. The Bible says darkness was over the face of the deep. But the preceding verse describes the earth, even in the presence of darkness. It says, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. I feel like preaching tonight, so I need y'all to go with me. And it says, 
the earth was formless and, and void. void. Which means no matter how much darkness you fill yourself up with, Jesus. you ain't gonna fill the void. Because darkness Lord. cannot fill the Woo. void. No matter how much sage, no matter how much witchcraft, hey, no matter how much sir. sex that you try My to God. fill yourself up with, it can't fill God. the void. Because darkness can only go over the surface. Hey! Ooh. He went over the face of the deep place. The darkness oh can only God. touch the face of the deep place. Oh. Which means it's going to cover what's really under. Jesus. Darkness can only touch the face of the deep place. And there's a lot of people dousing themselves in darkness, wondering why it's not satisfying, wondering why it's not filling the void. And it's because it cannot. There's a place inside of you that was made only for light. And if you don't make room for light, it's going to be empty for the rest of your life. I'm telling you what I know. Light can fill places in you that you didn't even know you had. Jesus. We got to sit under this for a minute. Because sometimes when we get in our Christian bubbles, we forget that there's a world that's dark. The world is very, very dark. If yes. you sat for a second and thought about some of the evils that take place on a daily basis yes. that you protect yourself from in your YouTube worship instrumental clips and you protect yourself from in every service that you sit in and you My don't God. sit with the uncomfortable fact that there are people being sold into sex slavery right now. Wow. There are people who are being raped and assaulted right now. This is extremely important. Darkness is everywhere and Christians gotta stop living in their Christian bubble long enough to remember Jesus. she was in the dark at some point the Bible says he translated you hey. out of darkness and sometimes you've got to get a little bit into the heart of God to see the darkness he snatched you <sighs> too many Christians shouting and forgot they was in the dark so too many Christians preaching and evangelizing forgetting that they was in the dark my God this world is in the dark which means that it obviously needs light. the light. Because the only thing that can deal with darkness Jesus. is light. Yeah. Yep. Now, the next question I ask might be surprising to you. The question I have is then what is the light? Or better yet, who is the light? And you would say, well, I thought we just described God as the light. So yes, it's true. And it is true about him. Isn't Jesus the light? Yeah, that is also true. But there's one more person. Wow, wow, wow. There's My one God. more person who has a responsibility, even an assignment. Come on, Stamper. And it's you. Yes. God says you are the light of the world. That's it. You. I said you. Oh, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. You've got to understand that this is your assignment. The Beatitudes talks about the constitution of the kingdom. This is where this passage in Matthew 5, 5 is found. And it talks about the way that Christians should live their lives. And while it gives principles and instructions, it dives into this place called identity. It dives into this place called purpose. That's why he takes a break and starts telling you who you are. And many Christians are wondering, walking around, trying to figure out what their identity is, trying to figure out what their purpose is. And if you just look through Matthew Matthew 5, I'll tell you who you are. You are the light. You're the light of this world. You are the light. I need you to hear this. It ain't just Jesus. Who's the light? And it's easy to put it all on Jesus and say, Jesus, do it. Jesus, fix it. Jesus, save him. Wow. Jesus, get him. Jesus, stop it. Jesus, interrupt it. But Jesus said, uh-huh, I did on the cross. And that's why I said, My Lord, my Lord. This my is Lord. a shared responsibility. Come on, you can't be nobody's husband and not carry your their hey! burden. God married you, and so now as his wife, yes! you have an obligation That's to it. carry his responsibilities in the earth. Come on, Stamp. You are the light. As a matter of fact, you are the light because you have the light. Hey. And it isn't just you and God separately. Lighten up the world. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, hear me. 
that even if our gospel is veiled, mm. it is veiled to those who are perishing, whom the minds of the God of this age has blinded, the devil, who does not, who does not believe, lest the light, the light of the gospel, Jesus. of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. There's a few things that I got to point out in this scripture. The first is that the light is connected to God's glory. Yeah. This is extremely important, but the Bible describes that light as the gospel of the glory of God, which means the light in you is actually a message called the gospel. You've, what's been placed inside of you by the power of the Holy Spirit is this message. And you can't have the glory without the gospel. Yes. If this scripture is true, there will be limitations that you will always kick up against in the power of God if you do not commit to this eternal message called the gospel. And there are a lot of preachers who are ashamed of the gospel but want the glory. And I feel the hand of God saying, oh. uh, 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 there is one message that is the power of God. It doesn't have the power of God. It is. And if you abandon this gospel, you can forget the glory. Wow. I feel it as a prophetic word over this generation. Stop preaching about angels and numbers and all this other kind of stuff. And can't nobody find the cross nowhere. Can't nobody find the blood of Jesus nowhere. Can't nobody find the Lamb of God nowhere. My God. I need you to pick up this eternal message. If Paul wasn't too good for it, you ain't too good for it. If Peter wasn't too good for it, you ain't too good for it. Matter of fact, if Jesus wasn't too hey. good for it, you ain't too good for it. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for hey. he has anointed me to Hey. The gospel. If Jesus ain't too good for it, you sure ain't. My Lord. The gospel and the glory go together. Jesus. You've got to commit to this gospel. But the next thing that this tells me, this is really important, that Jesus put his most valuable treasure. If you continue down, it says, we have this treasure. Hey. In yeah. earth and vessels. vessels. Which means God put his most greatest and most glorious treasure, which is the message of his gospel, inside of you and me. That's what makes us the light. The other part of this that's really important for you to understand is that if the gospel and the glory are the light, mm. then you can never use the phrase being a light as an excuse to not preach the gospel oh. ever Again, I am so tired of people sitting around saying nothing to people who are going to hell and saying, hey. man, I'm just trying to be a light. But the scripture says, let your light shine so, so that they will see, see your, your good works. works. If you would preach this gospel, they might see your life hey. and have a context for your goodness. Come on, sir. Ain't nobody going to randomly see you folding shirts and say, you must know Jesus. <laughs> the gospel gives context to your goodness. If you preach this gospel, they'll know why you fold so good. If you preach this gospel, they'll know why you sing so good. Come on. That's good, sir. That's good. That's it, Stamp. You are the light. Yeah. You are the light. I said you're the light. Yeah. Yes. I said you're the light. I said you are the light. And why that's important to you is because being the light gives you permission to live above the conditions of your culture. Hey. Why is this important to you? The Bible says in John 11 that Jesus found out that his friend Lazarus was dying or had already died. And he said, uh, uh, unlike what we think he should do, instead of running back to Bethany, he says, I'm going to wait two days. I'm still on my Sabbath. I'll come back another time. Because sometimes when God loves you, he'll wait. It's facts. Sometimes the best thing he can do for you it's is wait. wait. That's a whole other sermon. Come on. It's but facts. The Bible says, we're going to go through Judea. Now, contextually, the disciples are like, the last time he was there, the citizens of said city tried to stone you. They ran up on you and tried to end your life and end your ministry. And Jesus says this. This is extremely important. He says, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. Jesus. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus. Many people love the daylight because it hides them from the darkness inside. Oh. But when you've got the light on the inside, 
You ain't got to be afraid of dark conditions. I don't have to live subjugated to whether my conditions are comfortable. I don't have to live under the authority of my feelings when I've got the light within. It doesn't matter how dark my circumstances or my situations are getting. I've got a light on the inside. Uh, I appreciate your golf claps, but if you really <laughs> understood this, I'm serious, it would change the way you handle a hard season. It would change the way you handle your frustrations before God, and it wouldn't be the excuse for you to stop praying and stop coming to church. You understand that there is something in you that's primed for the dark. Who? Oh. And these conditions are the conditions I was made for because God put something inside of me that's stronger than my surroundings, that's stronger than my setting. I've got a light in me. Yeah. Come on, I've got a light in me. Turn to a neighbor and say, I've got a light in me. I got a Find light another in neighbor me. and say, I am the light. I say it one more time. Light. Say, I, I am, am the light. light. Do you know what it means? Come on. Do you really know what it means to be the light? I am light. Oh. Do you know what it means? Being a light is a labor. Anyone who's lived mm. as a light knows yeah. that being a light is a labor. Yeah. And there's one specific area that you've got to labor as a light. And this is going to surprise you, but I feel this as a prophetic word over every person in this room and over this generation. There's one thing that you are commanded to do as a light. China. I would tell you to guess, <laughs> but you don't have a microphone. Oh, well. <laughs> but when I read in the scripture, you don't understand exactly what I mean. The one thing a light is commanded to do it's shine. shine. Man, it's going to be good. Isaiah 60. Yes. The Bible says this. Arise and shine. Y'all know it? Does anybody know it? Come on. Arise, Arise and shine. Shine. For your light, for your light has, come. has come. And the, the glory, glory of the, of the Lord, Lord is risen upon, upon you. Have you ever considered that shining is a command? Wow. Whoa. Have you ever considered what? that God commanded you to shine? My God. He didn't encourage you. Oh. He didn't just cheer you on. He commanded you yes. to shine. Why? Because the glory oh. has risen upon you. Wow. Woo. When you got glory, when he put a light in you, you've got to let it shine. Wow. Wow. But what this tells me is. Because it didn't just start with shine. It said what? Arise. Mm. Which means that if you're going to shine, yeah. you, gotta arise. you got to get out of that low place. Jesus. You got to stop assigning yourself to that low place in your life and wow. that low place in your mind and that low place in your season. And you've got to get up from that place. And I know what you're thinking. You got Psalm 23 ringing in your ear saying, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But this is important. I did this in my Bible study. The Bible says that Jesus heard that John the Baptist was put in prison. I feel the help of the Holy Spirit. And it says he came to live in Capernaum. And the Bible says he did it so that the scripture could be revealed that says the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light and upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death oh. light has dawned which means you ain't never oh. gonna walk through a valley in the dark ever again you might be in a low place but that don't mean you ain't gonna be able to hey. see because Jesus came now you got a light in the low place now you got a light in the deep place now you got a light in the difficult place just cause I'm in a low season don't mean I gotta be confused. Just cause hey. I'm in a low season don't mean I gotta be cloudy. I've got a light. I said I've got a light in me. I've got a light in me. And it lights up the dark night. Yeah. Ooh. Jesus. You gotta shine. You gotta shine. Oh. You have to shine. You have to shine for his glory. It's your assignment. It's important. It's going to make sense of your life. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you do, you've got to shine for his glory. If you're called to fashion, you've got to sew clothes for his glory. If you're called to media, you've got to do media for his glory. You've got to shine. You've got to shine. You've got to shine. And by shine... I don't just mean the testimony of, of the gospel. I mean the excellence yeah. with which you live your life. Yeah. It's a combination of the two things, which we'll dive into in a second. 
but you're commanded. I need you to hear me. You are commanded to shine. This is extremely important to you because in most church settings, nobody told us we were commanded to shine. As a matter of fact, we were told to stay away from dark places. Oh, we were told to get as far away from dark places as possible. But you have no context for your commandment to shine if you're never around anything dark. If you keep yourself protected and insulated light, you'll never understand why God made you so bright. And you'll spend your entire life comparing yourself to other lights. We ain't none of y'all supposed to be in here. You're supposed to be out there lighting up the darkness. Jesus. You won't have any context for your life when you surround yourself all the time with light. Now, it should have a balance because when you're around the light, you realize who you are and it keeps you committed to the integrity of who you are. But when you're in the darkness, you realize why you are here. Yes. That's it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. This is important. We've been taught to stay away from darkness. We talk about the presence of the light and they, it, it just is that. But the Bible says something in Genesis 1. These are the things I pay attention to when I read scripture. Because most of the time, the way we talk about the presence of light is as, as though it makes darkness go away forever. Mm-hmm. But it does not. Genesis 1 says this, that when the light came, that God separated wow, wow, wow. the light from the darkness. He didn't get rid of the darkness. Yeah. He set a boundary and restricted its access so you can know the difference. This is extremely oh. important for some people in this room. That boundary is called consecration. You can stand yes, sir. in the dark when you've been separated and designated Come by the on. hand of God to make the difference and the distinction between you and what's in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. This is good. God separated and let them stay in the same place so that creation could know the difference. Oh. There's some people who are called to dark places. There are some people who are called to difficult places. And the issue, I think, with some of our rearing in Christianity is we weren't prepared to stand in dark places. We were prepared to stray away from them. We were prepared to stay away from them. But this here is not, it's not a cool message. It's a commissioning message. It's a commissioning message. It's a sending message. And I'm not advising anyone to be unwise. That is not what we're about. That's not what Black Voices is about. We're not telling you to put your salvation on the line. But what I'm saying is consecration can do a deep enough work in you. Yes. That God can make you be in a position where you don't have to be distant to be separate. Wow. Oh. You don't have to be distant to be separate. Follow me. This is extremely important. Actually, people will begin to see the difference. And sometimes the closer you get. Yes. Yes. Jesus. There are some people who are called to be clean and close. Follow me. This is important. You can be close without getting dirty. You can be close without staying clean if you're consecrated. Sir. If you're consecrated, you can be close and not get dirty. Jesus. Because you're the light. Because you're the light. And what's the point of your life? Except if you shine. You've got to shine. You're empowered to shine. You're commanded to shine. You're created to shine. But the thing about light in scripture is that the issue is not about existence. It's actually about something else, which I want to talk about. It's about permission. Almost every place where the issue of shining is mentioned, the word let Mm. is at the beginning. Whoa. Even at the beginning of the creation story, it doesn't say that God called the world to make light. Mm. It says that he asked for it to let it be. Whoa. Which means he created an opening of permission. To let means to permit, which means it allowed light to be, which means the issue is you need to give yourself permission to shine. You are already the light. But you need to give yourself permission. This is why he said in Matthew 5, he didn't say, make your light so shine. He said, let 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 your light so shine. You've got to allow this thing to grow. You've got to allow this thing to be seen. You've got to give permission to it. And you may not think that you need to give permission. Uh, Like it would seem obvious if you have something so beautiful. And so bright and so brilliant. Why wouldn't shining just be the automatic response? Mm. I'd say that Matthew 5 points to something that we see in the culture today. 
which is the issue of hiding light. Oof. Jesus. They have the light. They're in a lost and dying world. But they choose to hide. Jesus would have never juxtaposed letting the light shine with hiding it. Mm. If it wasn't relevant to someone who would hear it. Mm. Which means that the opposite of letting your light shine for many is hiding. There's a lot of people who are hiding their light. Wow. They're keeping their testimony to themselves. They're keeping the gospel to themselves. They're keeping their gifts to themselves. Let me ask you a question though. Doesn't it make sense that the world will be dark if the light is hiding? Oof. If the very light of the world is hiding, no wonder the world is dark. Jesus. We've got to make a decision in this room and we're going to give ourselves yeah. permission to shine the way that Jesus told us to. Ephesians 5.13 says this, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Yeah. For anything that becomes visible is light, which this is important because this will give you a hint into why. We'll dive into the why, but this is the foundation right here. What this tells us is that light in the kingdom is produced a specific way, and it's produced by allowing yourself to be exposed. Jesus. It's produced by allowing yourself to be seen, which is part of the reason why we don't embrace our calling to be the light, because God forms that light in us when we allow ourselves to be visible, which means it requires vulnerability. It requires openness. It requires us to open ourselves for God to see everything that's on the inside of us and to make us into whatever he wants to make us. And there are some things that hold us back from doing so. But before I dive into the reasons why, I've got to give you a bit of a warning that according to the scripture, there are only two things that you're going to do. You're either going to let your light shine or you're going to hide it. But there's a specific place where you hide it. And there's something prophetic about this. So I got to lean in. It doesn't just say that, it, that the light was hidden. It says it was hidden in a basket. Jesus. Now, when has it ever been smart? <laughs> to set fire <laughs> under a basket Talk about it. which means you're either going to shine or you're going to be self-destructive oh. you're going to choose but you'll destroy everything around you as Ooh. long as you don't obey your assignment to shine there are some people in this room who have perpetual cycles and have perpetual compulsions and you think the issue is that you're not ready for your assignment but if you say yes to your assignment the authority of that thing might just break Ho! My God. You're either going to shine or you're going to self-destruct. You're either going to shine or you're going to destroy your family. You're going to destroy your legacy. You're going to destroy your future. You've got to let it. Because it's going to come out. The light is going to light. No matter what. And if you don't put that thing in its proper place, it's going to start destroying stuff. I say this to you in the fear of God. Let your lights shine and stop hiding it in places that are not built to contain. This is the next one because it's important. It wasn't just about the fact that it was wooden. It was about the fact that it was not built to house the thing that it was supposed to be hiding. Ah! What? Okay? Oh this my is God. Because where did he put yes, it? Lord. Revelation. Jesus. He took it off of the basket and put it where? On a lampstand. On a lampstand. Now, if you've read the book of Revelation, oh, oh. You know, lampstands represent something. Come on. Uh, Anybody tell me what they represent? Church. I remember something called the seven lampstands, yes. which represented the seven, seven. Churches. churches, which means church was never supposed to be a place where you was going to hide from your assignment. You was never supposed to be hiding in these pews. You was hey. never supposed to be hiding behind these sermons and behind these songs. The church was supposed to be a context so you could stand up under your assignment and shock before the world. Stop using church to hide from God. Stop using ministry to hide from God. You better let this thing set you up so that you can shine. Wow. What the heck? <laughs> Jesus. Oh my God. Now you're starting to understand <sighs> why there's so much darkness. Because the light is on a place. The light is hiding. It's all starting to make sense. I feel, some, I feel some weight on that. Wow. The church is a lampstand. <sighs> it's a lampstand. Which means if you are light, 
You're supposed to be connected. And if you ain't connected, your light's going out. Appreciate you. I'm the temple. No, we the temple. Yes. Trying to do this thing by yourself. Your light's going out. By the fear of God, love people. Find a church. All right, here we go. Oh. <laughs> oh. Help me out. Okay? I don't want to get, I don't want these people to like me. But not really that much. I love y'all. Okay. Um, here we go. Sometimes you got to love people so much you don't care if they like you. Hold the conversation for another day. Now, why is it so perpetual? It's starting to make sense to you, but there's a piece of this that's important for you to understand. And it's the concept of definition. Can everybody say definition? Definition. And the concept of definition means that a word can mean two different things to two different people. In other words, if the Los Angeles Lakers and the Boston Celtics play them play each other in the NBA championship and the Boston Celtics win four games to nothing. Uh, listen, I'm a Lakers fan. I was doing that for humility's sake. We're going to pray for y'all. So, all right. Okay. And the Boston Celtics win, they do their thing. That piece of information means something different to Lakers fans than it does Celtics fans. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. Celtics fans gonna be running around the city parade. Lakers fans gonna be crying. Does that make sense? <laughs> Which means that presence of the same thing and the definition of something is determined by its listener in many, many ways. Wow. And this is important for you to understand about darkness. Because darkness is scary. For someone who wants to see. But it's safety for someone who wants to hide. My God. Follow me. Follow me. What? Darkness is scary <laughs> for someone who needs to see. But it's safety for someone who wants to hide. And there are a lot of Christians who are celebrating the conditions of this culture. Because it allows them. Who? They're celebrating the condition of their schools. Because it allows them. Come on. Jesus. Come on. I'm saying this to you under the fear of God. Fear will make you so self-absorbed that you'll celebrate oh. conditions that benefit you even though they destroy others. Oh, my God. My you'll God. celebrate them. It's the reason why people say stuff like, I know God's called me, but uh, uh, I'm running. <laughs> you think it's cute that people are dying while you play with your assignment? You what? think it's cute? That people are living without the living God because you don't want to do what God told you to do. I understand resisting. I understand struggling. But we're going to stop this thing in church where we think it's cute to disobey God. The words I'm running and a laugh should never be in the same sentence for somebody who's got the fear of God. You can't laugh about the fact that you're resisting the call of God in your assignment. You celebrated conditions that are costing people their lives. Woo! Respectfully. Jesus. Whoa. Jesus. Darkness is nice for people who like to hide. But think about this. This is important for you. As long as you hide your life, you're making somebody else suffer. Wow. Think about how long it took for you to get saved. And in your depression, and in your angst, and your death, and your difficulty, and your decay. Think about a light that chose to hide. Think about when you were in the depth of your suicidal ideations and nobody could tell, nobody could see because the lights were hiding. I need you to understand this. You were deep in addiction. You were deep in frustration. And because there were lights, some of y'all, there were lights all around you. Yep. You were sitting in church struggling. Yep. You were sitting in church ready to die. But because the lights were hot. Jesus. You struggled way longer than you had to. Do we want to continue the same legacy for another generation? Or are we going to break the cycle tonight and say, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit make me. I'm going to shine for the glory of God. I'm going to shine with this gospel. I'm going to shine with this message no matter what it costs. Stop celebrating the conditions that are helping this world go to hell. Because it makes you comfortable. I feel the Holy Spirit is, is, is under the fear of God. We as Christians have to stop playing cute with hey. the fact that we resist the hand of God leading us. It's not cute. It costs people their lives. There are people who die every day. There are people who get kidnapped every day. And think about the believers who are sitting there playing footsie in church instead of doing what God told them to do. 
I'm not saying we don't go to church because I love church. But what did I say? It's a lampstand. It's meant to be a situation that sets you up for your destiny. Not a place where you hide for your, for your assignment. That's right. That's right. So the question I have for you is why are you hiding? What are you exactly afraid of? Wow. The crazier part about this is that Matthew 5 says this about the light. It says that you are the light of the world. A city sat on a hill that can what? That cannot be. So why would Jesus talk to you about not hiding if you can't be hidden? Mm. Every church kid knows exactly what I'm talking about. You try to hide, but everybody knows who you are. Oh, oh, oh. It's impossible. <laughs> trying to go to the club. Don't know none of the songs. Trying to dance, but you shopping. <laughs> You can hide even if you want to. Hello. You're a city set on a hill. Hear me, hear me, hear me. You can hide even if you want to. You can try, but you can't hide. But there's a generation still trying to hide. And people are being damaged in the process. But people can see that you ain't really from this world. People can see that there's something on hey. the inside of you that's actually at work. But your resistance to take accountability for it is what keeps it from having authority and power. Bruh. The Holy Spirit is here. He's dealing with some people in this room right now. Okay. Why are you hiding from shining? Mm. Genuinely, I'm asking you a question. Why are you hiding? Is it because people told you that people like you don't shine? Mm. Is it because people from where you're from don't shine? Or people from your story or your education? Or your background or your trauma are supposed to live ordinary lives. They're supposed to do nothing exceptional. They're not supposed to make a difference. They're supposed to get by. Is it because someone took a display of greatness in your life um, and literally like put a wet blanket on it through the call to be humble? Oh. You know what kills me? My. When people don't take account for the fact that people live with raging insecurity yep. inside their minds. And so whenever they do something good, you feel like it's your personal assignment to keep them humble. My so God. Day, inside their mind, you know that encouragement will keep them humble hey. faster than a rebuke. Come on. Yes. Now that's good. That's facts. Anybody ever did something good and you were just waiting for that person to say, I'm proud of you. And all they could say was, be humble. Don't get too big headed now. You still this so-and-so. You still from over here. You still this, this, and that. People think it's their assignment to keep you humble. Jesus. So what happens is you live in what the what is called false humility yeah. in order to please people. Yeah. All the while, people in the dark because you ain't shining. Wow. Is that the reason? It could be, but there's probably one reason above all, and I promise you I'm almost done. It could be possibly because we feel like we ourselves are in the dark. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this kind of darkness is a little bit different. It's the kind of darkness that only a few in our society have experienced. It's kind of darkness called blindness. Mm. And blindness is interesting because it doesn't matter how many lights are on. If you can't see. It doesn't matter how bright the lights are on around you. I know the Bible says your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But for some people, that scripture don't mean nothing to them because it feels like they can't see. So how are they going to walk? How is the light going to do anything for them on that path if they can't see? They feel confused by their circumstances. Feel confused by their story. Feel confused by their pain and it feels blinding. I, I know some of y'all might have seen the movie Ray. Some of us joke around about whether or not we believe Stephen Wonder is really blind. <laughs> we do all these kind of conversations, but there's one example I want to talk about that's important for you to personify this. It's a man by the name of Bartimaeus. He found out that Jesus was passing by and we never describe the cries of a man gone blind. There was a cry that came out of 
um, Bartimaeus that was like no other man in history. And I believe it was connected to the blindness he experienced. Because if anybody's really experienced real confusion, it's more than just, just the feeling of confusion. This is what Bartimaeus cried. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Which means that confusion and cloudiness literally can feel like a judgment. If you don't know where you're going and you feel like you have no idea which way is which and which way is that, you can feel like God is mad at you and you did something wrong and you got to pray until he opens your eyes because if he opens your eyes, it'll be the sign he's pleased with you. That's how blindness can feel. When you can't explain your circumstances, when you can't explain the difficulties in your life, when you can't explain the setbacks, when you can't explain the financial struggles, when you can't explain why that person oh. lived and why that person did you wrong and why that person wasn't there for you. It feels like blindness and you wonder where God is and you wonder how he can ask you to walk under the authority of this assignment when you can't see where you're going. Jesus. There's a generation who feels like they're blind. It's walking around, light all around them. They can feel it on their skin. They can feel it on, literally in their bones, but they can't see. So it feels like it's limited in its ability to produce fruit in their lives. But can I encourage you real quick? There's a man in the book of Acts that proves a principle that's going to change your life if you catch it. God ain't never been scared of a season where you feel like you're blind. And Acts 9 proves it because there was a man named Saul who was riding along to persecute some Christians. And the Bible says that he was interrupted by a light that knocked him off of his horse. But according to scripture, the Bible Bible says that that light made him blind. This is extremely, extremely important. Whoa. God called it literally, there was the divine blindness that hit his life because he had to learn how to stop living according to what he saw. Ooh. There was a blindness that God orchestrated around okay. his circumstances. I need you to understand this. This is important because Acts 26 tells us that Paul was describing his own assignment and the commission that God gave him. And one of the things he uses to describe this assignment, it was that he was called to the Jews and he was called to the Gentile. And what was he called to do? To open blind eyes. How is a blind man? Called to open the eyes of a generation. How is a man who can't see nowhere where he's going called to help other people see? Dang. How? How? It doesn't make sense to you. Until you read one more scripture. I know I got a lot of scripture for you, but it's healthy. It's a good, it's a balanced breakfast. Okay. So here we go. There's a difference between being blinded by darkness. Mm. And being blinded by light. Jesus. Sometimes it ain't the devil who blinded you. Hey. Sometimes it's God because the way you were leading was according to your own eyesight. It was according Whoa. to the kingdom that you came from. And I can prove Whoa. it according to this scripture. The Whoa. Bible says in Matthew 6, verse 22 and 23, that the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body it's will be full, full of, of light. light. Follow me. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light is in you is darkness how terrible is that darkness Whoa. which means there is a darkness inside of some people that's a counterfeit light and you're living like you can see but the light that you're seeing is actually darkness so sometimes God's gotta blind you for just a little bit sometimes God's gotta put some things around your eyes Whoa. so you can learn how to lean so that you can learn how to follow the voice that's what it means when it says we walk by Faith and not, not by, by sight. It didn't mean he wanted to resign you to a life where you couldn't see. He was trying to retrain your eyes to not see according to the pattern of this world. He was trying to retrain your eyes to see according to the yeah. pattern of the scriptures and the pattern of the kingdom. Somebody in this room is about to experience what a God would call a divine blindness. Hey. You're about to experience a divine blindness. You've been going according to what you can see in your logic. You've been going according to what you can see in your intelligence. But the Holy Spirit has come to blind some of you for oh. with a sovereign blindness so that you can see for the first time in your life. Jesus. <sighs> Every blindness ain't the devil. But I promise you that he'll oh use my the God. to show you how to see for real. Ooh. He'll use the blindness to show you how to see for real. Oh and for some people, that sounds good. Mm. It's like, man, that's good. That's a good point to shout. If I had an organ, we would have a praise break, second <laughs> praise break. On that, it would be beautiful. But the issue isn't necessarily that I can't see. 
it's not just the issue of blindness in the physical nature. The issue that blindness presents is that you're not just called to be something you don't know how to be. Yeah. You're called to be what you need. Ooh, oof. This is important. It's important, especially for a generation of young people who God wants to put the yoke of the assignment of God on your life. And the first question that comes up in your heart is how can I be a light when I need a light? How can I be a spiritual father uh, to a generation of orphans when I've been barely fathered ooh. myself? How can I take responsibility for my community when no one took responsibility for me? My God. I need you to understand this. There's a difficulty that comes upon your life when God asks you to be what you feel like you need. Uh, Anybody in this room with an assignment know what I'm talking about? That's the T about trying to break a generational curse. You love tweeting and Facebooking about breaking generational curses. But the person who breaks the curse has to choose to be what they needed. And they don't have to live under the excuse that they didn't have it in order to decide to be it. If I live according to the knowledge that I didn't have a father and say I'm not willing to father, you know what's going to happen to my son? He's going to say the same thing about me. When are we going to break the cycle and break up with these excuses and decide I may have needed it, but I'm going to be it? I feel the Holy Spirit on this. We got to drop the excuses to the wayside because you've been given everything that you need. Then I hear the Holy Ghost taking a hammer to the fear of responsibility in people's hearts all around this room. He's smashing it to bits so that you can step into your assignment. If you believe that thing, can you just shout all across this room? Come on, come on, come on. I feel the Holy Ghost on this. The fear of responsibility is about to be broken off of a generation and you may never have seen somebody wear this yoke, but you're going to do it to the glory of God and the spirit is going to lead you according to his will and according to his purpose. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hey. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit in this room. Oh He's breaking that lack mindset off of a generation. Oh. I feel you right now. There's some people in this room Whoa. who have avoided every godly responsibility that God's trying to put in your life because you're afraid to fail. But the devil, he is a liar. It's time to shine. Turn to your neighbor and say it's time to shine. It's time to shine. Find another neighbor and say it's time to shine. It's time to shine. I've been living in the dark for too long. I've been hiding in the dark too long. It's time. It's time. And I'm going to shine. Whatever I do, I... Jesus. Oh. When you live in the fear of what you didn't have, when you live in the awareness, the crippling awareness of what you needed and didn't receive, there's a word for that. And it's an uncomfortable word that we don't often talk about oh. inside the black church because it can make people manifest real strong. Hey. It's a word called the orphan yep. spirit. Yep. Oh, yeah. And the heart of the orphan spirit is to live according to what you lacked. It ain't just about your dad not giving you enough hugs. It isn't just about somebody leaving you. It's about the mindset where you live according to what you didn't have. And everything that you build and everything you assign yourself to is according to what you feel like you were missing. And it's according to what you feel like was vacant from your life and what you feel like didn't show up for you. Wow. Oh, God. So many people build their lives in accordance with their emptiness. In accordance with what they feel like they were missing. They literally build their entire lives on that foundation. But do you know how weak that foundation is? Do you know how unsustainable that foundation is? You'll eventually crumble under that pressure. Because a fence ain't strong enough to build a family. Oh. My God. And anger ain't strong enough to live under the weight of this world. And even if you don't say yes to your assignment, just the, yes, the assignment of living is too much if you're going to build up on a foundation of the lack of what you have. Yeah. It cripples people. Ooh. It cripples people. It leaves them in depression. It leaves them in cycles of addiction. It leaves them in all different kinds of stuff because they're living full of awareness of what they didn't have. Orphan. Sonship issue. How about that? Jesus, Jesus. It's shining. 
is a sonship issue. And if you feel and live as though you're an orphan, you'll use all the excuses in the world not to shine. But there's something about God that will change your life if you allow it. Like I started this message saying that I'm fascinated with the way that God chooses to reveal himself all throughout scripture. And there's a particular name of God that we do not often time enough explore. I believe it's described in the book of James. And the name of God that is described is the father of lights. He's the father of lights, which means that if you're a light, you have a father that's going to help. Wow. Jesus. He ain't just a separate light. He's the father of everything that has an assignment to shine. And if you know a good father, they orchestrate circumstances to set their kids up to shine. It's why he put the gifts in you. It's why he gave you the platform. It's why he gave you the influence. It's why he gave you the grace. It's why he gave you the anointing. It's because he's the father of lights. Oh and he God. loves to watch his kids shine, shine, shine. Shine, shine, shine. You've got to understand that you don't got to shine as an orphan. You've got a father that's cheering you on. Say, go ahead, son. Shine. Show up that gift you've got. Go ahead, daughter. Shine. Show him that anointing you've got. Go ahead. Show him how you dunk that basketball, son. I want you to shine. Show him how you preach that sermon, son. I want you to shine. Not for yourself, but because your father wants to see his work in you manifest in the earth. And the glory of God. The Bible says that every gift is given by the Father of Lights. Wow. Which means the one who wants you to shine is the one who gave you the gift. Oh. He's not live, telling you to live under the yoke of false humility. He's not telling you to live like you ain't gifted, like you ain't got grace on your life, like you ain't got anointing. The wow. Father of Lights is the one who gave you the gift. So no wonder why he's asking you. Wow. Sure. If I can get the band up here. God's breaking the authority of this orphan curse. First Thessalonians says, we are the children of the light, which means that light is a family issue. It's a sonship Ooh. issue. When you understand this, then you'll never be afraid to shine again. Because even if he didn't, your father didn't show up for the basketball game, God's standing there like this. Oh. Dump that ball, son. Oh, even if dad didn't show up, there's somebody who was standing right there. And the Bible says that when mother and father forsook me, the Lord will... You've got to choose to stop living like you spent one day without a father. You've got to choose to stop living like you spent one day without your help, without your assistance, without your support, without your foundation. Come on. You've always had a father. You've always had a father. Stop running around here telling people that you raised yourself. Stop running around here telling people that your mama was your daddy. You had a father. You had a father. You had a father. You had a father. He's been there the whole time. He was there the day he didn't pick you up. He was there the day he dropped you. He was there the day he disappointed you. And he's been telling you, shine, baby girl. Shine. Shine, son. Shine. Do what I put in you. Use what I placed in you for my glory. There's something being broken off of this generation. Huh. And the name of it is false humility and fear of responsibility. And both of them show up with our people who believe that they're orphans. And the yoke of fatherlessness over the African American people is beyond the lack of presence of men in the home. Yes. There's an entire framework of mind where so much of our culture lives according to what we lacked. It's why most of our worship songs are about our struggles more than they're actually about Jesus. It's the reason why every rap song you love talks about the struggle that you know, came up from and all this other stuff. It's perpetuating a mentality where all of your success is built around the things you suffer. It's the reason why we hate generational wealth. 
And that's why we make every generation have to get it for themselves. When the point of generational wealth is so that your kids don't have to work the same way you did. They're not spoiled. They have a father. They are spoiled. They have a father. My God. The reason why you see it as spoiled is because you feel like you didn't have one. And you had to work for everything. And nobody handed you anything. But what I'm trying to tell you is your dad is more rich than theirs. Your dad owns everything. Uh, there are some people in this room. Everybody is. I believe it applies to you. But there's some specific people God's highlighting who this light inside of you has been dying to get out. It's been dying to get out and you've been trying to restrict it with everything that you have. Whether it's because of frustration, whether it's because of guilt, whether it's because of condemnation, whether it's because of the absence of affirmation, whether it's because nobody ever told you that you were gifted enough to be who God told you to be. They just told you about the standard, but they didn't tell you you were empowered to do it. See, that's the power of the law. It'll remind you of the standard, but will never encourage you that you've been empowered to meet it by the, by the oh. Holy Spirit. That's the heart of the law. And that's the difference between the law and grace. That's why you have no longer perceived a spirit of bondage again to what? Fear. Fear. Because when you live under the standard, but don't know what God put in you, you're always a little afraid of what you know you're supposed to do. You'll always live afraid of the way you know you're supposed to live. You'll always live afraid of the standard that's been nagging at your ear ever since you were a little girl and ever since you were a little boy. It's not because you don't believe it's true. It's because at the heart of it, you believe you can't do it. If you're honest with yourself, you've known you were called for a long time. But if we can be honest in this church tonight, the truth is you just believe you can't do it. Because you've been living according to what you lack. But what you got to understand is that Jesus died. And the Bible says that to as many as believed on him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God. Which means you can choose to become a child. You can choose to stop living like you ain't got a father. And part of the authority of this is the power of the Holy Spirit will fill you to accomplish every assignment God's called you to live. Whether it's the assignment of holiness, whether it's the assignment to, to tear down the seven mountains and whatever else it is. Whatever the assignment is on your life, the Holy Spirit will empower you to do it. But he's the spirit of adoption. Yes. He's the spirit of adoption. He's the spirit of adoption. And he put a light in you. He put a light in you that this world needs. So you can't live under the thumb of what you believe that you can't do. And what you believe you lack. And what you believe who wasn't there for you. And what you didn't have. And how much money you don't have. And how much scholarship you need. And how, how many people didn't believe in you. And how many people said you weren't going to be nothing. You can't live under that authority anymore. I'm going to have the band play for just a minute. But if this, can we just stand up all across this room? For the power of the Holy Spirit is going to fill this room. Thank you, Lord. <sighs> Jesus, Jesus. There's something holy about the call to shine. So many people try to accept the call to shine as orphans instead of sons. And the platform becomes the premise for their demise. Jesus. But when you accept the call to sonship, you accept the call to consecration. Yeah. Which gives you the equipment you need to stand up yeah. under the assignment instead of the, letting the assignment have you. So if you know that there's a light in you that you've been holding back. It could be the formal message of the gospel. It could be your gifts. It could be your talents. It could be a career that God's called you to. It could be an assignment to be a father or a mother, whatever it is. If you know there's something you've been holding back from God according to what you believe you lack, I need you to do me a favor and just lift your hands all across this room. Jesus. Something 
is holy about accepting the assignment to shine. And for us as a people, there's been so much shame that we struggle with the fact that we're actually called to shine. We're actually called to shine. You're anointed to shine. And the Father has assigned you to shine. Yeah. He's called you to do it. And I just feel the Holy Spirit is about to break the reproach of the orphan spirit off of some people tonight. That makes you ashamed of how gifted you actually are. It makes you ashamed of everything that God put inside you. It makes you hold it back for fear of people being intimidated of you and for fear of people not understanding you and you becoming something that can't be fully articulated to the world around you. There are some people who are so afraid of being alone that they won't let the light shine. If you feel like you need freedom from this propensity to hide, this bondage of the devil, would you just run up to this altar? I'm going to make a, a one, two, three call. There's some people in this room who know you need freedom.